Good morning. It is seven o'clock and my name is Tyler Bolter. I am one of the ophthalmology residents in the Department of Ophthalmology. And I'm going to be, um, I guess, starting the meeting today. First off, we want to make a special announcement for today's session. Uh, today's session will start with an award presentation. And so that will um, make it so only one half credit of CME will be available for today's session. And so attendance will not be recorded for the first half from seven to seven thirty. And so our six letter code, which will be texted into our typical number, will be available at 730. And you'll have that 730 till 8 o'clock to sign in to get attendance. Um, and so after that, we're just going to say welcome to our grand rounds. Once again, if you're a visitor, whether it be a medical student, alum, global colleague, or any other visitor that is with us this morning, we would invite you to identify yourself by your name and in our chat area so we can keep a better idea of who is attending our grand round to be able to help improve um, and see what we're doing. So first off, I'll um, now turn the time over for the presentation of our inaugural Matthew D. Davis Professorship Award. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a great Friday. Um, it's nice to have an inauguration. Um, and, and on a celebratory note, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Terry Young. I'm the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences here at UW. Uh, today, we recognize and celebrate Dr. Barbara Blody. She will become the inaugural professor to be named esteemed Matthew D. Davis uh, professor. Um, Dr. Davis, whom we affectionately call Denny, was a giant in the ophthalmologic world and was a key driver to our department's reputation and stature. He served as a past department chair and retina specialist. Dr. Davis was born in 1926 to Dr. Frederick and Edith Davis. Um, as you know, Dr. Frederick Davis was the first chair of the Division of Ophthalmology at UW, uh, which was within the Department of Surgery. Denny's educational training began at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, where he earned his undergraduate degree in 1947. He attended medical school at the University of Pennsylvania and then returned to Madison to complete his internship in ophthalmology residency training. Um, he did take a, um, a, a, a brief um, hiatus between 1953 and 1955 when he joined um, uh, in active duty for the U.S. Naval Reserve. After that service, he completed a retina fellowship training uh, program at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, where he was awarded a HEED fellowship. He then came back to UW-Madison uh, as a clinical instructor of surgery in 1956 and quickly rose to the ranks to professor and head of the division. Uh, he was instrumental in elevating the division into a formal Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science and served as its first chair for 16 years from 1970 to 1986. In 2020, this year, we celebrate our 50th year as an independent formal department within the UW University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health to, uh, to Denny's credit and to his hard work. During Denny's tenure, the department exploded. He expanded the residency training program, he added key fellowship trained subspecialty uh, clinical faculty um, and hired basic science researchers to, to, to start and then enhance a translational research program and to develop a true academic department. Furthermore, he formed our Fundus Photograph Reading Center, which at the time was the first centralized independent research center for randomized clinical trials of retinal diseases uh, in the country. With his collaborators, he established the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study, Classification of Diabetic Retinopathy Severity, which still to this day remains a gold standard of retinal change assessments um, for diabetic retinopathy trials. He also collaborated in the development of the age-related eye disease study classifications for age-related macular degeneration and also for cardiac-related lens opacities, also still considered gold standards of assessment. In 1971, the director of the newly established National Eye Institute and the National Institutes of Health asked Denny to, stir, to serve as a study chair for the groundbreaking diabetic retinopathy study. Results of this seminal study established scatter laser 
photocoagulation as a standard therapy for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which substantially reduced the risk of severe vision loss worldwide for this disease entity. At the time, approximately half of all patients diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy became legally blind within five years. Over the next decade, that figure dropped to 5%. The seminal diabetic retinopathy study randomized control clinical study um, trial established the template for future eye trials. In 1996, Denny retired and was awarded professor and chair emeritus. He continued working at the FPRC as a rehired annuitant essentially until his passing. I joined the department in 2014 and had the privilege of working with Denny and came to know, appreciate, and be inspired by his dedication to the department and his research, inspired by his work ethic, his humility, and his academic acumen um, of this gentle giant. Dennis, Denny's legacy includes over 270 papers, published uh, peer-reviewed papers, and book chapters, the mentorship of countless faculty, staff, and trainees, and numerous medals and awards in ophthalmology and medicine, including the 2016 Laureate Recognition Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology for Seminal Contributions to Ophthalmology. Basically, that's our Nobel Prize in um, the, in the uh, academic ophthalmology world. We said goodbye to Denny on March 5, 2018, but the impact he had on patients and the field of ophthalmology is immeasurable and unforgettable. He had a profound influence on many of us within and outside of our organization including the mentorship and partnership of the professor we celebrate today. I now introduce and congratulate our first awardee of the Matthew D. Davis Professorship, Dr. Barbara Bloody. Although Dr. Um, Robert uh, Golden, Dean Golden, could not be with us in person today, we have a recorded message to share with you. It is wonderful to be with you today, virtually, for this glorious celebration as we honor and recognize the amazing accomplishments of Dr. Barbara Bloaty and her recognition as the Matthew D. Davis Professor. You know, it's always a great honor to receive this type of recognition, but in this case, considering the namesake especially so, we all know that Denny Davis was an icon, one of the real creators of what is now one of the nation's top departments of ophthalmology and visual sciences. And what a wonderful recipient for this great recognition. Dr. Bloaty is amazingly accomplished, serving in leadership roles in some of the nation's most important multi-site studies, focusing on such important areas as macular degeneration and other visual illnesses related to the process of uh, aging. At a personal note, I just want to recognize her amazing leadership. She stepped into a very challenging situation in the Fundus Reading Center, and because of her effective leadership, it is now once again one of the most impressive jewels in the crown of the academic programs, not only of the department, but indeed of the School of Medicine and Public Health. So, Dr. Blody, congratulations, well deserved, and on Wisconsin. Well, thank you. I concur with Dean Golden that Dr. Blody has provided impressive and monumental leadership to the Fundus Photograph Reading Center and to the department. It had faced significant challenges, but is now a thriving unit. Uh, in 2014, the FPRC was an 11 employee strong unit and since then has hired 30 new employees as well as um, mentored um, 71 undergraduate students. Within the past six years, the FPRC has had 68 clinical trials and now generates a revenue of approximately $2 million per year. The FPRC has published 47 manuscripts. Many are major collaborative uh, papers. The FPRC trains imaging fellows, residents, and medical students, a lot of Shapiro scholars. Um, so its educational impact is, is um, uh, multifold. 
And the FTRC is an international powerhouse. Um, there's a slide here uh, below, uh, which shows its international reach and, its, uh, and it continues to grow. Dr. Blody's reach and accomplishments are numerous and will be outlined by our next speaker, Dr. Michael Altuwil, professor and co-director of the Fundus Photograph Reading Center. Um, it's my pleasure to speak about uh, Barbara Blody and her accomplishments and um, how deserving she is at the uh, inaugural Matthew uh, Dean Davis MD professorship. Um, Barb has been uh, the, is a professor and uh, director of the Fundus Photograph Reading Center, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about her training and, and then go on about her qualities, um, who she is as a, as a person to me. Um, and uh, her training uh, started in University of Iowa, um, at, uh, and then she uh, was uh, doing political science and uh, French and spent some time at the University of Paris at the Sorbonne. Uh, went on to a master's in law and, and diplomacy um, at Harvard and Tufts, and the uh, the diplomacy part I think has uh, uh, has stood her uh, well throughout her life. Um, medical school, University of Iowa, and then she went on to uh, Bascom Palmer uh, for both residency and then a medical retina fellowship with Don Gass. And after that, she did another two years of fellowship um, as a surgical fellow at the Kellogg Eye Center at the University of Michigan. And so you can see uh, Barb has a really extensive training and um, this really leads to, to part of her um, qualities, uh, one of them being uh, ob her obvious intellect. Um, I trained here as a fellow and Barb was one of my mentors. Um, and um, it, now I'm a fellowship director and I always encourage all of our fellows and all of our students to actually to spend time in Barb's clinic uh, because she has the most um, steady, engaging way of teaching um, and uh, taking the time both with the patients, but also with her um, trainees to, to uh, educate them and pass on her knowledge. And it's, it's always an unhurried pace uh, where you can actually really learn uh, versus some of the more frenetic clinics that other people can go to. Uh, her breadth of knowledge is amazing. And has only really grown and grown as Barb has uh, uh, taken her skills to clinical trials. Um, so uh, I think her teaching ability is is uh, tremendous. Uh, the, her mentorship uh, does not extend just to her residents and medical students, but also to her faculty, uh, where she has been a leader in, in faculty mentorship um, and uh, bringing along her colleagues. And I would be one of those who has learned from her throughout my career. And she has brought along a, a lot of other faculty and, and is always encouraging of us. Um, in terms of patients, um, I, I consider uh, uh, Barb to be uh, very, very patient, both in meetings, uh, working with sponsors for clinical trials. Um, it, is a, it is a different realm than dealing with us or with her patients, uh, where she has to deal almost in a business manner, really, with sponsors and their demands uh, when they want to run their clinical trials. Uh, we all see the pace of business is, is different than ours, and uh, Barb has learned to be a leader in that. Um, and, uh, and that's her next quality is leadership. Um, leadership extends in many ways, but um, Barb has been involved in many, many clinical trials and has been a, a national leader in 18 clinical trials throughout uh, her career. And these are trials that, that can involve 50 centers and we work with a thousand centers around the country, around the world. Um, and uh, Barb is a leader for, uh, is uh, assist in the, works in the leadership of those studies, but also is now the leader of the reading center. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Young uh, briefly spoke about that and as, as did Dr. Golden, uh, that we had at, uh, not so many years ago, a crisis in uh, the reading center uh, where we had difficulty financially. And there came a time where it was possible that this center would not continue. Uh, but with Barb's leadership um, through a, quite a difficult time, and again, the, the, the quality of diplomacy being so important, uh, she was able to steward uh, the reading center back to full health where we now um, can treasure it and really gain and continue to make us a, a very prominent uh, department nationally. Um, 
in terms of being the Matthew Davis uh, professor, uh, really, um, Barb is the most uh, excellent steward of Dr. Davis's ideals of scientific rigor, reproducible assessments, collaborative science. Um, he would sit in his office and, um, and um, really share his wisdom. And Barb would often be seen in his office learning from him and really has, has continued to grow um, his ideals. So, uh, you know, those were ensuring that clinical trials were, uh, were masked trials and provided the best evidence uh, there for very important things. And Barb had, was involved in bringing anti-VEGF therapy to, uh, to the patient population. And, that, and this has helped save the vision of millions of people over time. And uh, uh, one of the ones that she worked on would have been Lucentis, uh, clearly the, the first very, very effective anti-VEGF therapy. She's also been uh, a steward of the macular degeneration trials of the National Eye Institute and is very closely linked to those investigators. With the Diabetic Retinopathy Network, which I, you will hear a little bit about shortly, um, she has continued those national collaborations with, with centers all around the country um, and with comparative efficacy trials and now moving on to artificial intelligence trials. And the reason that, that, that artificial intelligence companies come to us is because the reading center is the gold standard. And that is in great part really started with Dr. Davis and then continued on by Dr. Glody. She has been, she was the director of our clinical trials unit for eight years as it grew and principal investigator for 18 national clinical trials as a reading center principal investigator. Um, and that has been a clinical investigator at our clinic for 63 trials and has 94 peer-reviewed publications. So Barb has been extremely productive. This is a uh, picture uh, a few years ago of the Reading Center staff, and this has uh, had, had reduced at one point uh, to about 15 people and now has grown to nearly 40 once again. And that is because they are being so successful and are really pushing the future and working with artificial intelligence. And have also really supported um, the department. So we uh, will have the potential to work on stem cell therapy in the future because of a microscope that was supported by, in, in great part, by the Reading Center. There are many other initiatives at the department that are supported by uh, Barbara, Barb's forward-looking vision. Um, one of my, uh, most of, one of Barb's most important qualities is her belief. Um, it, it is clear when you interact with her, her belief in Dr. Davis and in his, in the research methods that he espoused and uh, her belief in her colleagues. Um, she truly is um, a guiding light uh, for, for me and for many others in the department. And she has such strong belief in her university. So when she is portraying our work and um, our methodology around the world, um, you know, people believe Barb. Um, her uh, last qualities are, uh, are very important qualities are friendship. Um, Barb made us feel welcome when we moved here uh, 22 years ago and as uh, we continue that friendship um, and uh, in family, uh, she's a friend to uh, all of the people that she works with at the Reading Center and in our uh, department. And for family, I wanted to end with, uh, you know, the most important part here, we have a picture of Jeremy and Andrea with Barb and her husband, uh, Justin Gottlieb. Uh, hiking near Estes Park, uh, where they have a cottage and here, I believe this might be a, a, a gala or, or maybe um, Andrea's graduation. Um, and uh, I think, uh, again, she values family so greatly. And uh, uh, we are so happy that uh, Barb is part of our university family, uh, our ophthalmology family, and she is most deserving of this award. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Altawil. At this time, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the family of Dr. Matthew Davis. I'd like to recognize uh, the Davis and Lane families here. Dr. Davis was blessed with a large family and he had nine children, Anne, Peter, Amelia, Lisa, and Matthew, um, as well as Kristen, Rick, Peter, and Christopher. I've had the honor to meet with, Doc, uh, with Nancy Davis um, on several occasions, uh, Dr. Matthew Davis's uh, wife, 
It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Nancy, who joins us today to share a few words about the collegial relationship between Dr. Davis and Dr. Blody. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Davis. I'm Nancy Davis, Denny's wife. After reading the professional listing of both Denny and Barb's careers, it is understandable how much they enjoyed working together. They're not only competent professionals, but compassionate human beings. If Denny were here, he would be pleased that Barbara was selected as the first winner of the Matthew D. Davis Award. The award is an endowed professorship to advance the senior clinic faculty members who worked in partnership with Dr. Davis and supported his work. Thank you, Nancy. It is now my privilege and pleasure to proudly present the Matthew Davis Professorship to Dr. Barbara Blody. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor, Dr. Blody. Wonderful, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Mike. Those are wonderful, wonderful words. And I am really deeply honored um, by this Davis chair. It's so meaningful to me to be part of this reading center, the department, and to be have, have been mentored by Denny. Um, I am absolutely standing on the shoulders of Denny Davis and all the research staff at the Reading Center. Um, every day I learn from them and I'm so impressed by their expertise and their dedication and their wisdom. Uh, if we could go to the first slides, Jackie's gonna run that for me. We can uh, yeah, start with that first slide and I'll just go into my thanks that I do also want to thank, deeply thank the Davis family for this generous endowment and my heartfelt thanks to Nancy Davis and Denny. I wish he was here. Both of them had such a big role to play when we were interviewing for this position and during our tenure in the department. Um, I'd also like to thank my family and friends who've given me so much support and guidance. My parents, my husband, my kids have and always will give me honest and loving advice. And I really want to acknowledge all of the ophthalmologists in my family. Luke, we can go to the next slide. I, I'd like to um, acknowledge, of course, Nancy and Denny Davis and the Davis family. And I wanted to give a shout out to all the ophthalmologists in my family. There's Lewis Gottlieb, Marvin Gottlieb, Frederick Blody, Christopher Blody, Rick Blody, and my favorite ophthalmologist, Justin. Today, I'd like to present an overview of Denny's contributions to ophthalmology and his very hard work in developing the foundation for our care of patients with diabetic retinopathy. I have no financial conflicts of interest. So on the next slide, I have three objectives in this talk. The first is to share the evolution of the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study, ETDRS, the scale that was developed in ophthalmology, and to, present, to also present current uses of the ETDRS diabetic retinopathy scale, and to discuss future directions. Um, next slide. So what is the ETDRS scale? Just as an introduction to that, briefly think of the scale as a staging system for diabetic retinopathy, similar to what you would do for a cancer patient. It describes clinical features that really are biomarkers for visual acuity. It allows a clinician to understand the extent of the disease and the risk of progression of disease, and it helps the clinician determine treatment options. So, next slide. To go back in time, I'd like to look at the evolution of the ETDR scale and how it became so important. So, on the next slide, uh, it started over 50 years ago when, in 1968, two young ophthalmologists, Mort Goldberg and Stuart Fine, organized a meeting at the Airlie House in Virginia on behalf of the federal government that was both for retina specialists and epidemiologists to come to consensus on how to even describe and classify the retinal findings seen in diabetic retinopathy. It, it seemed there really was a need to speak the same language. 
so that a clinical treatment trial could begin. Three years later, the diabetic retinopathy study did start. It used this early house classification. And this study was designed to treat, to find treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. As you heard, it's a blinding condition. In 1971, the first large treatment trial began that included the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The early, it's called the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study. And the study itself looked at three different things. It looked at aspirin versus placebo. It looked at the efficacy of focal laser for macular edema. And it looked at the timing of panretinal photocoagulation. All of that in a group of patients with the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So on the next slide, so Dr. Davis recognized the need to describe the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, not just the proliferative type. And the initial scale was expanded. So you can see on the right this illustration that shows you on the bottom arrow six broad categories of proliferative disease. But what Dini then added in the ETDRS were six more broad categories of non-proliferative disease. You'll notice that there are significant, there are separate steps uh, that are numbered. So from 10, 12, 14, 15, 20. And I'll just give you some historical information that actually Dini had 100 steps in the scale to begin with, 100 categories of severity level. But in the final analysis of this study, uh, it was mer they were able to merge. Uh, so we are down to 12. So uh, that was why these numbers jump uh, around and don't uh, follow one after the other. So in this uh, study, there really was the first time there was interest in nonproliferative disease. The first step was to, to be able to treat proliferative disease, which was blinding. And now attention was turned to nonproliferative disease. And the goal of this scale was to standardize the assessment of diabetic retinopathy uh, features for the non-proliferative and to provide information for the patient. So I'm gonna go over those two things. So on the next slide, you can see that the first goal, the standardized assessment of diabetic retinopathy was really um, to allow clinicians to define retinal features using kind of the same terminology. And for graders at the reading center, it allows them to be very uniform in their work. They are using standard reference images to help define the severity of retinal features. So here you see an example of standards that we use every day for mild on the left, moderate and severe retinal hemorrhage in one photograph of the eye. So this has really been a highlight, a hallmark of this scale is to use photographs with which to measure severity. On the next slide, I want to go into a little bit of detail about who does this assessment, who's using this scale, and how do they do it. So the scale is used by graders at the Reading Center. So as was mentioned, the Reading Center was established also 50 years ago, um, and Denny decided to use non-physician graders, non-physician research staff to analyze the images. And in his opinion, this would give us a more, less biased, uh, more independent view of the, of the retina and the changes in the retina, recognizing that physicians may have some bias because they know the patient and the treatment. It was really important to standardize the protocols for implementing the scale. So there's an imaging protocol, and you see on your right, this sort of map of circles that shows us where to image the retina, and this is the left eye. There was certification of the photographer, so they had to show they could do this, they could take the appropriate pictures, and we had to certify the camera system. So this is still in play today. We, we always certify photographers and camera systems. And we use a standardized grading protocol. And that's a detailed grading protocol that also uses these reference images. On the next slide, you can see this outline of 
the 12 steps of the diabetic retinopathy scale. And so there's 12 numbers that you see, but I will tell you it's alphanumeric, meaning under each number, there are letters that are subcategories. So you really, the grader has over 40 categories to choose from. On the next slide, I'm gonna address the second goal of this scale and it, when it was created was to provide predictive or prognostic information from, from, for the patient. And this was done by analyzing the fundus photographs of the untreated ETDRS participants. So the ETDRS trial was very valuable. It provided us information that aspirin did not affect diabetic retinopathy. Uh, we learned that laser could prevent vision loss in diabetic macular edema. And we learned that timing of PRP uh, did not have to occur before high risk characteristics appeared. But I think for Dini, the most important part of the ETDRS trial was the untreated half of the NPDR patients. It's because he looked at those untreated patients at five years and looked back in time to see how they progressed that he could create this scale that was meaningful for the rest of us to understand what happens to patients if they get no treatment. In fact, Dini analyzed half of the control population and then in order to validate, so independently validate that uh, his, his results, the grading data were reserved, half of those patients' uh, data was reserved in order to later validate his results. So on the next slide, I am gonna show you some data um, to show you how well does this scale work. And this was published in the ATDRS report 12. There is a lot of data in that, in that paper, but I'm really gonna concentrate on this. What he showed, what Denny showed is that the baseline level, so at the beginning of the trial, the level of diabetic retinopathy matters. You see on the left in this table, the four, le the four levels within NPDR, and you see in the next column, the risk to that patient of developing proliferative disease at one year. And there's a significant increase as you get more and more NPDR. So 5%, 12%, 26%, 51% chance of getting proliferative disease in one year if you have severe NPDR. And this was so important uh, for us to understand what is happening um, to our patients and what to expect. So this was really a very important uh, table in this, in this paper. He goes on to show what happens at five, what happens at three years, what happens at five years. And that becomes really valuable when we're analyzing data even to this day. Um, it is brief, I will mention that this table is frequently used for clinical trials because we're calculating a sample size. Statisticians need to know the number of patients that would reach proliferative disease in order to calculate how many patients are needed to find a meaningful difference if you're looking at a new treatment. So this is an important table for us. So now I'm gonna change into really the current, what's happening currently at the Reading Center. So on the next slide, I'd like to share with you some of the details of how the Reading Center currently functions and currently uses the ETDR scale. Well, what we do is really preserve what is, was done in the past. So the Reading Center graders continue to evaluate that 12-step scale according to the original grading protocol. And the graders, the non-physician non researchers, undergo training and certification of, of their ability uh, with the original set of training photographs from the ETDRS tr trial. And as was done in the trial, the evaluation of the diabetic retinopathy level, those 12 levels, is performed by two independent graders. So two people do the grading and a senior grader adjudicates it if there's disagreement by one or more steps on that scale. And actually this, this continuation over decades of what had been done and validated has been incredibly valuable for those who are looking at improving our treatment and the care of diabetic retinopathy. 
So on the next slide, I'm going to show you how hard we work to keep things as accurate and reproducible as possible. So at the Reading Center, graders are continuously tested for reproducibility or the uniformity they have with each other. And this is done in all clinical trials, so not just diabetic retinopathy, all clinical trials that we do at the Reading Center undergo this regrading. So reproducibility is tested by putting 5% of all the photographs back in the grading pool. And another grader will grade the same eye. They don't know that they're doing it twice the second time around. And they're able to, uh, we're able to analyze uh, the differences. And to your right, you see a table where we look at these comparisons. It looks like a grid, but we're comparing grader A to grader B. The other important piece that happens over time is what's called a, bi a, a temporal drift exercise. This is done when a study is a long-term study. And so I think we all remember the DCCT trial that established that good blood sugar control was important for diabetics. It now continues under the name of EDIC. That study has been going on since the mid nineties and each year, every other year, in fact, um, there is a set of eyes of images, photographs that are graded by the graders and it's exactly the same. So the same photographs are graded to see if the whole group of graders are reproducible with the group from the past. So it's a way to sort of keep up with what uh, has happened in the past to make sure that there's no change over time. And if there was a big shift uh, in the graders from, to the, from the present to the past, um, that could imply some systemic bias in how we're doing our work. So we're analyzing this data all the time to look at the percent agreement. That's the most common and also weighted Kappa statistics. So I'm going to show you on the next slide. This is my, my last piece of data. But this to me is remarkable that there's reproducibility of the ETDRS scale. There's data over decades. So from the ETDRS in 1991, the end of the study, we saw an exact agreement between the two graders of 53% and within one step of 88%. In this edict study, we just did the biannual regrading. And in fact, they did better than what was done in the past um, this time around, but it helps us understand that the graders are comparable and reproducible to what was done in the past. Um, this is something that uh, I've shared with the FDA. The FDA knows about um, this sort of accuracy, and that's um, been sort of a big feather in our cap. On the next slide, I'm going to show you that there are some limitations in our current use of this, this uh, scale. I will say that it's too complex for clinical practice or for screening patients. In the clinic, in a busy clinic, we don't think about every uh, of these 12 steps. Um, we actually have a simplified five-step scale that we just have in our head where there's no diabetic retinopathy, mild, moderate, or severe, non-proliferative, and then proliferative. And that's what's often used, basically used in teleophthalmology. And also there's been recent discussion about how the ETDRS scale, which is based only on fundus photographs, does not include important components of diabetic retinopathy, such as ischemia, neurodegeneration of the inner retina, and even the effect of anti-VEGF treatment. So on the next slide, uh, I am going to show you where we do use this scale. It is, um, it is commonly in use uh, in clinical trials for diabetic retinopathy. We're currently doing 12 uh, different trials for diabetic macular edema and uh, diabetic retinopathy, and we use the ETDRS scale. For many years, the FDA has now required the use of this scale in all trials of new drugs or treatment for DME and diabetic retinopathy. And that includes trials of diabetes control, um, whether through blood pressure, blood sugar control, laser treatment, steroids, and anti-VEGF medication. And in fact, the FDA has specified that a two-step, that if you can prevent two-step worsening, the two-step progression on the ETDRS scale, that is a clinically significant 
measure of the effectiveness of your new drug or intervention. So if you can stop the progression, that's um, that's considered by two steps, that's considered um, meaningful. What's really interesting is over the last 15, five years, since 2015, we've seen improvement can occur in the ETDRS level, and that was a surprising finding. In anti-VEGF trials, the vascular endothelial growth factor trials for treatment of diabetic macular edema. So in the RIDE-RISE trial, which looked at Lucentis, Vista Vivid, which looked at Aflibrisep, there was a surprising discovery that not only are we treating the edema, but also the diabetic retinopathy. And I'm really proud to say that uh, that really first was observed by the readers, uh, the graders at the Reading Center and written up by Dr. Domopoli and Dr. Ip when he was here. It's it's a really quite a landmark change in how we then can treat diabetic retinopathy. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you an example of a patient from this Lucentis ranibizumab study where there's improvement in the edema. And we see that on the top, uh, the OCT and the shows us a lot of fluid in the retina. And after 12 months of injections with the medication, the patient is greatly improved. And that was the goal of the trial. But what was found out with uh, astute observers and a lot of good data from the Reading Center is that the diabetic retinopathy improved. And you see this patient with non-proliferative disease on the left at baseline, there's hemorrhages and some microaneurysms. And that really has cleared up uh, with the administration of this, of this drug. And that's a bit still, still something we're analyzing and trying to understand. Um, on the next slide, you'll see kind of an interesting plot uh, of data from this study. So this was the same uh, ride rise study. All patients had macular edema. Some two of the uh, arms of the study included the drug, the ranibizumab or Lucentis. And you see in that middle column, a low dose, and then on the right, the high dose. And the patients in these two doses really showed improvement in their diabetic retinopathy level. If they had moderate severe diabetic retinopathy, it went down to mild. And that happened at about one year, six months to a year, and lasted through the duration of the study where people were getting very frequent injections. So this is something we're looking at because we don't know how durable this treatment is. We really don't know if this can change at all the underlying root causes of the diabetic retinopathy, such as ischemia and neurodegeneration. But it's been an interesting uh, five years to try to look at what's happening. In the next slide, I'm gonna go into a second area where we currently use the ETDRS scale. And as was mentioned, it's definitely uh, been in frequent use to assess artificial intelligence in diabetic retinopathy screening. So here at the University of Wisconsin, we have teleophthalmology for diabetic retinopathy screening. And Dr. Liu is the principal investigator for our health, our UW Health program that's used in primary care clinics. She's got camera systems set up in primary care clinics. And at this time, it's eye care providers who are grading or looking at those images to decide whether a patient even needs to come into the eye clinic. But there is more uh, now use or discussion of use of artificial intelligence to do the reading or grading, so to speak, of the fundus photographs. And I will say that these companies are looking at software that's really just giving us a yes, no. Yes, the patient needs to go to the eye care provider or no, they don't. It can be set up with a non midriatic camera in the primary care office and the patient, the physician may, in some cases, be able to use artificial intelligence. Software to screen a patient for diabetic retinopathy or macular edema. And here are some of the companies uh, below that we have worked with. But 1 big question is how well does the algorithm perform? How well does this uh, AI system perform against the human grader? interpreting the ETDRS scale? Well, that is uh, the big question. And so, at the next slide, 
Uh, you can see that the FDA is also involved. So the FDA has um, definitely got guidance on the next slide. The FDA has definitely been busy uh, providing guidelines for a whole new area of medicine uh, and in medical devices, which is software as a medical device. It's not a medication. It's not a, an artificial hip. It's the software that's working as, used as a medical device in screening patients with what they call referable diabetic retinopathy. Do you, does the patient need to get further um, follow-up for eye care? And in fact, the FDA requires a randomized clinical trial so that we can compare the human grader to the algorithm. They recognize that the ETDRS scale is the reference standard. It is what they call the ground truth in order that's needed in order to validate that software. Two years ago, one company, IDX, uh, did receive the first approval in all of medicine for an AI system to screen for diabetic retinopathy. On the next slide, I'll just summarize um, by going into the future. How are we gonna use this ETDRS scale beyond 2020? Well, I'd say the future is really bright because there's already incredible demand in clinical trials and artificial intelligence uh, that we continue to use that ATDRS scale. We are doing research at the Reading Center to examine whether or not we can add to the scale. Can we add to the power of this um, very, very important ATDRS scale by quantifying proliferative disease, as you see in that middle image, or by adding new types of imaging, such as an ultra-wide field image, which you see on your left, or new modalities such as OCTA. So I hope I've convinced you of the durability and precision of the ETDRF scale over such a long period of time. It's quite a remarkable and long-lasting achievement, and I'm really, really proud to be part of it. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you to the whole group who's organized this. It's really been a wonderful morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I really appreciate it. And thank you to all the Davis family for coming. I, that's wonderful. This is fabulous, Barb. Actually, are there any, any questions about her presentation? So I don't have any questions. This is Tyler Bolter again. I just wanted to announce for the people listening on their phones what the code is to be able to sign in before 8 o'clock, which is in a couple of seconds. So we have for our code, we want you to sign in with H as in Hector, E as in Elmo, W as in Wilmer, W as in Wilmer, E as in Elmo, B as in boy, QWIB. And that's the code. If you can sign in, that'd be awesome. Thanks again, Dr. Bodie, for a great um presentation and also being a great mentor to department. Oh, thank you, Tyler. That's awesome. Have a good weekend. Okay, I guess this concludes. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations, Barb. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank right. you, thank Take you. Take care, stay safe. Bye.